Akia repa shampa repa te karemo shoto barendo praka tia kanabusi sata repa kuparomo she. But don't just be spectators, get into the Holy Ghost right now. Pare ko she to ropa ku marendu ku bashen karema su ko peretu bashen kareno bakuna barenda repa ko sekra. We need the baptism in the Holy Spirit in this country. We need to be washed, cleansed in the blood of Jesus. Come out the graphic on, please. We need the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. Whoa. Little bit of Pentecostal history. Is it okay to use the word Pentecostal here? I mean, that's maybe not attractive for the local community. They might think that's a bit extreme. Might put them off coming. Would you like to claim the word Pentecostal in this city? Yes. Let's say Pentecost. Pentecostal. Pentecostal. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. A little bit of Pentecostal history because it's amazing. I mentioned this the other week in our mentors time. At the beginning of the 20th century was the biggest revival since the Book of Acts. Church historians would say. The Azusa Street outpouring. Amen. The 20th century was birthed in an outpouring of revival. The greatest, pen, it was the, the birth of the Pentecostal movement that in, in the eyes of the secular became the fastest growing religious movement on the planet. And of course it's not religious, we know that. And it was birthed on New Year's Eve at the turn of the 20th century. The Spirit of God fell and it, and it, it, it was in different places and it was in a place called Azusa Street in Los Angeles. And there was a, a, a man called Charles Parman and William Seymour. William Seymour was an African-American, suffered a lot of prejudice. A one-eyed African-American guy, and Charles Parman, and various other people, and they had the fire of God. And a lot of their mindset, and a lot of their thinking, was influenced by early Methodism, okay? By the early Salvation Army. And, and they, they had a, a mindset, a theology, if you like, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which needs to be recovered in this land. Now, you may have heard that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is called the second blessing. No, you've ever heard that term. You know, you get born again, you get saved, praise God. It means you, you, you go to heaven when you die. And the second blessing, you get baptized in the Spirit. In Azusa Street, they called it the third blessing. Okay? The second blessing was sanctification. They, they taught, and they, I believe they rightly taught and, and encouraged that people had to tarry and seek God for the baptism. It wasn't just a quick fast food type thing. It wasn't just a quick oh, just baptize in the spirit, that's it. Cha -la 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 -la. It wasn't just fast food, no, that's it. Because the heart had to be dealt with. The heart had to be dealt with. And who knows, if, you, you might be saved from the wrath to come, but if you've got strongholds of bitterness, resentment, pornography's addiction, the, the Holy Spirit can't occupy those places. And it's helpful to understand the word baptism it's not a very good word. It wasn't translated from the Greek properly. They left it. They just left the, word, the Greek word baptismal. The word baptism means to be saturated. It means to be immersed. Completely overwhelmed. Say overwhelmed. I want to be saturated and overwhelmed. You know, just like you get people who are possessed by demons. I want to be possessed by the Spirit of God. Amen. Oh, and, and demons just get an entrance into a person without permission. People get possessed by demons. The Holy Spirit wants permission. Holy Spirit, possess me. Yes. Amen. Yes. So anyone, anyone got the call to say, Holy Spirit, possess me. Yes. Possess me. Yes. I don't care what people think. I don't care what people say. Amen. I want to lose myself. I want to lose my natural mind. I want to lose my mind completely. I'm yes. done with it. Done with a carnal old mind. I want the mind of Christ. I want the mind of Christ. Amen. The word Christ means anointing. Amen. Anointed one. I want an anointed mind. A mind that's full of God. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to be saturated. And what they taught them, people had to be cleansed. God had to do a deep work in people and sort them out. And then they got this full of baptism of the Spirit. And often when they spoke in tongues, it was real languages. And people would hear and go, oh, you're called to be a missionary to so-and-so. And it's like, goodbye, off you go. And that was a powerful move of God. And yet at that time there was, other, there was obviously a lot of warfare in that movement. Maybe there was extremes. I mean, okay, if you get extremely on fire for Jesus, it's, it's not tame. 
And but there was another another there was one guy in particular called Rutherford who who became part of Azusa Street. And he taught a different doctrine. And he said, ah, oh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. This religious, this legalistic, this seeking the presence. Seeking the baptism. Ah, ah, ah. Just receive it by faith. Now we know, technically, we receive it by faith. Amen. But it's, a, it's, it's twisting. It's splitting hairs over a term. The word faith, for instance, is just, the word faith, you know what the, one of the definitions of the word faith? It means to cleave to. Like a husband and a wife cleave to each other. When you've been married for a long time, you get more cleave to each other. Your relationship goes deeper and richer. I mean, my wife's only been away for a few days. I'm missing her all the time because I'm cleaved to her. I'm one with her. And it hasn't come me easy. Cleave to. And so it's not just, oh, I just believe. And Rutherford taught, hey, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just one, bam, boom, boom, fast food. Boom, sha la 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 la. You're baptized in the Spirit. People weren't. And then somebody stole the mailing list of Parman. They didn't have internet back then to spread the news of the revival. Everything went out by newsletter. I've got books of the newsletters. They're awesome. If you read those, you get a fire off them. And someone stole his mailing list and the revival began to die. There was so much persecution against it. But catch this, the influence of Rutherford, this quick, easy baptism in the Holy Spirit, pseudo baptism in the Spirit, that went into the church in North America and Europe. The baptism in the Spirit, the real baptism in the Spirit, went South America and Africa. Well, answers on a post called, where is revival happening on earth today? Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere? It's in the sun. It's in South America, it's in Africa, it's in Asia. When this revival hit Europe, the Welsh revival caught a fire from that. Praise God. The revival spread across into Europe, into Germany. And the leaders, the evangelical leaders have released a formal declaration called the Berlin Declaration where they denounced this move of God and said it was from the devil. That was in 1910. And four years later, World War I. Why did we have two world wars? For a number of reasons, the devil didn't want Israel back in their land. Number two, because the professing church blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Blasphemed, rejected and hated the Holy Spirit. And rejected the move of God. Rejected the move of God which resulted in two world wars and the deaths of tens of millions of people. We can't afford to reject the move of God for the love of man. Well, I want to, I, I just want to please people. I want to get along with people. I don't want to be too edgy. No, I want to please God. I want to please God. We need a real baptism of the Spirit. We need to be right with God. We need the cleansing of the blood of Jesus to prepare us for an outpouring. If, if God was to pour out His Spirit in some places, people would have to die. You know, guys, look. I love, I love this church. I love what God's doing. You know, we had an outpouring last Sunday. We've got to keep with the movement of the Spirit. There's no guarantee the Holy Spirit's going to come next week or the week after. If we receive it, Jesus himself in this, and the Holy Spirit grace us with their presence, with their tangible presence, and we're touched but not changed on a Sunday. Catch that, touched but not changed. Touched but not changed. And by Monday, we're lukewarm. By Monday, we're full of just the cares of the world. We're just like the unbelievers. When they hit a the crisis, they fall apart. When we hit a crisis, where's our limitless God? Where's Yahweh? Where's the, the great I am? Who? And by the next Sunday, the ground that we should have had, we're not there. And it's like we have to stop. Get, it's like we don't want to go back to zero. In this country, we've got to wake up. Jesus is coming so soon. I believe it, I believe it could be in the next decade. I mean, we're talking a matter of years. We're not talking a hundred years for Jesus. We're talking our lifetime. He's coming soon. There has to be a cleansing of the blood. You know the scripture, Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14 says, When I shut up the heaven and there's no rain, when locusts devour the land, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. 
So if there's no revival or outpouring, the church should be in revival. The church should be in outpouring. Mm. That means that the people are not right with God. That means the enemy is devouring the territory. In our nation today, it appears that the enemy is devouring the territory. But I tell you what, God is going to move. Yes. God is going to move. There is a remnant in the nation yes. that God is preparing. The solution to this is humility, to pray and seek his face. The, the word face in Hebrew is the word panim. And it, it, the, the word, the, it means presence. The word presence and the word face are exactly the same. It's the same Hebrew word. The presence of God is where you tangibly experience him. But we can live in a day and age like today where we can have church where there's good message, it's a TED talk. It's a TED talk with a Bible verse, one or two thrown in, with no presence. No presence, no tangible presence. And this is, listen, the tangible presence comes where there's a sacrifice. That's a, a spiritual law that has to be a living sacrifice for the presence to come. If the presence of God's not in a place, it's because God goes, I don't smell sacrifice. You can have good precepts, good positive message, have a TED talk, and go completely unchanged, completely unequipped in the warfare, in anything. There was a man called Charles Finney who had powerful revival. There's a lot I could say about him. He said this, they used to quote the scripture, Hosea 10, 12, break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. We had like an outpouring of the Spirit last week. The Holy Spirit's been here today. He wants to do so much more. Guys, we've got to have our hearts cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We've got to now break up the fallow ground and please don't receive the day and be touched and don't be changed. Don't tomorrow morning, I've already lost this. God is not going to bring out pouring without our hearts being dealt with. And it, you know, catch this. This is just a brutal truth and I've had to swallow it myself. If I am not feeling the presence of God, yes, I said feel. If I'm not experiencing the presence of God, there's only one reason. I have a hard heart. That's it. And Jesus said to his disciples, he said, why are your hearts hardened? And it's not like they were doing any overt sin at that time, or sin will harden the heart. They were insensitive to the presence. They were casual with the presence. Casual with Jesus. Say whatever. Hardness of heart is the, the reason why we don't experience the presence. I'm including myself in this. And if I don't, if I go a few days without experiencing the presence, go one day, I need to be concerned. Look, I could get up in the morning and get into this with my head. But if I don't have the presence, this will kill me. I've got to worship him. I've got to bring, I need to bring an offering. And people come here and go, got to, got to. That sounds a bit heavy. I'm a priest. We're a priest and a king. That's grace. God has made you a king and a priest of God. A priest. What an honor. Yeah, we have an access into the presence of God. Yeah. And coming into that, it's a temple. Heaven is a temple. Never mind stupid people say things, oh, there's roller coasters there and there's candy floss, stuff like that. There's not. Okay? People like that are deceived. I'll tell you exactly what's in heaven. Or you, how can you know what's in heaven? The Bible tells you. It's a place of worship. It's just one big temple. With the Lamb of God right at the center of it. And if anyone doesn't like Him, it's not for them. That's it. Heaven is not a place for human carnal pleasure. And you know what? I'm sure it's beyond your wildest dreams. If you've ever experienced the presence of God, had a visitation, it's like, God, take me now. But heaven is one thing. Heaven is a temple. The, all, the, the temple, the tabernacle, is that is a type and a shadow of what's up there. That's all it is. Which is going to, you know, not sitting on a cloud playing a harp, worshipping Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.
Well, well what, two people are excited about that. Every other vision of heaven is just pagan. Pagan. Ugh. God is coming back for, I tell you why, I know there's going to be a revival, because Jesus is coming back for a spotless bread. That, it says in Ephesians 5, 26, 27, that he might sanctify her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish, sanctified, set apart. That means God wants to set you apart, make you distinct, make a demarcation around your life. Do you know, yes, God does want to prosper his people more than you could ever. But there's two different types of prosperity. There's the prosperity, the TED Talk type prosperity. That just comes from the Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence and power positive thinking type prosperity. And you know, it's pretty good. It's good, it feels good, but it doesn't have the presence on it. The type of kingdom prosperity God wants to bring you comes from the presence of God when you get his purpose in your life and when you've been face to face with Jesus and he reveals his plans for you and tells you the reason why you live, wow. why you breathe and then you get into that purpose and then all the prosperity follows because you're doing his business. Hallelujah. So this isn't a religious thing. Oh, we've got to live so holy. Oh, being holy is religious. Be honest, who here has had deliverance? I hope you've had deliverance. Praise God, we're not ashamed. It's always going to be a few passengers like that. Amen. Isn't it? It's going to be a few passengers like that. Get rid of a few lodgers. Hallelujah, a few critters. Do you know what? You don't have to put your hands up and show this, but maybe there's people here, not maybe. There's people here, you've had um, demons of lust, pornography. Could be homosexuality, all kinds of stuff. And to the, to the person who's not right with God, holiness is religious. Yeah. I tell you what, living demon free is, is amazing. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. You know, having a demon free life is a good life. Because if you've been bound up by demons of pornography, lust, sexual perversion, yeah, your flesh might crave our drugs. Or whatever it is, your flesh is craving, the demons in you have craved this expression. The demons that have oppressed your life have craved these lusts and you've never been satisfied. And the, the lie is, holiness is boring. Hello, holiness is free. Amen. Holiness is a life free of torment, Amen. free of fear. Right. Hallelujah. It's awesome. Be holy because God is holy. It's a free life. Being demonized is not good. <laughs> Offering your members as an instrument of unrighteousness is not good. It's not fun. It's not fun. The devil's not fun. The devil's not a happy person. No. It's full of bitterness. I mean, if you're honestly, I wouldn't recommend having a conversation with him or one of his cronies. The devil genuinely believes that he's done nothing wrong. He genuinely believes. I was a good worship leader, me! Sorry, I'm not just going to <laughs> The devil, I have to be standing. The devil honestly believes, what's the problem? I was bringing good worship. I was the head hunt show. I mean, I was bringing better music than anybody. And do you know what? I was even better than God. I wanted to give him advice. I was anointed. I was the anointed cherub. I had the anointing on me. God wasn't running the universe quite, you know, I wanted to get on his throne and all I wanted to do was sit next to him, like move along a bit. I know things better than you. And he threw me off. And it's not fair. I was so anointed. I was so gifted. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. And he's full of bitterness. And he's going to be bitter in hell forever. And all bitter people are going to be with him. And if you're bitter, you might end up with him. If you don't repent and get delivered. I've been bitter. I come from a bitter city. A city full of bitter people. You'll be delivered of it. The sweet water is on the inside of you. Oh, Karen, my shepherd. The, the 
the bride has to be cleansed. Our blessings are on hold until we're cleansed. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 7.1. It says this, Therefore, having these promises, beloved. Who's that speaking to? Christians. Beloved. 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 Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfect and holiness in the fear of the Lord. Right. Who is responsible to initiate the cleansing? Well, now listen, I've been doing a little bit of laundry this week. My wife's been away. So, oh. Four or five loads of washing their bears on this. I'm shouting at the kids, stop leaving wet towels on your bedroom floor. Put the clothes away. I don't want to stop leaving dirty clothes on the bottom of your wardrobe. You guys have to wash them. Anyway, I have to do the laundry. But I thank God it's not like the old days by hand. I thank God we have a washing machine powder, conditioner. We have to initiate the cleansing. He provides the agents for the cleansing. It's supernatural. Cleansing is supernatural. We can't cleanse ourselves, but we have to present ourselves for cleansing. He isn't going to do it. And listen to this. This is a lie that I want to shoot down. Your mouth stop distracting. There's a lie in the body of Christ. And it's a it's taking a verse of scripture and blowing it up beyond what it really means. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May your whole spirit, soul and body be sanctified. We are three parts, spirit, soul and body. And the teaching goes like this. Your spirit is sealed and perfect all the time. You don't have sin in you. Now I'm not being legalistic. I'm not pointing anyone saying, you've got sin, you've got sin. No, no, I'm not doing that. But the teaching goes like this. It's part of the hyper grace. You don't have any sin in you. Yeah, you can't sin. Your problem is in your mind, in your will and emotions, in your soul. And then if you just believe, right? No. Just uh -uh -uh, have some semantics, mind over matter, you'll automatically never sin again. Because you're thinking wrong. And then but if anyone brings any exhortation and instruction that's biblical, oh, that's legalism. That's born law. That's doing that. Do you realize there are over 1,000 commandments in the New Testament telling us how we should live? How to be an employee, how to be an employer, how to be a husband, how to be a wife, how to be a child, and on and on and on. And none of it's legalism. Hello. You know, I don't want to be faithful to my wife anymore. Why oh, are you putting law on me? I just feel like giving in to my urges. That woman at work. Do you know, I literally knew a, a Christian guy who did that. Who went through some trials in his marriage. And didn't want to, oh, that's legalism. He lost his marriage for it. This whole thing that, oh, I'm just perfect on the inside. I had someone say that to me three years ago and he was in fornication. Wow. Perfect on the inside. What? God, I not you. Listen. It says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1.13. It doesn't say we're vacuum sealed. Speak this word. We're not vacuum sealed. Speak this word. I'm sealed to my wife. I wear a ring. I'm sealed to her. If you're married, you're sealed to your partner, your spouse. If you're stupid enough, you could commit a, you could commit adultery. I'm sealed to the Holy Spirit. And by His grace, Him working in me, I don't want to commit adultery to the Lord Jesus. I love this present world. And compromise and sell out. Listen, James says this, James 1.5, to Christians, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full, full grown, brings forth death. That's not to unbelievers, this is to Christians. The Bible says, we read it, we ought to cleanse ourselves from filthiness of spirit and soul. That one verse tells you, look, I'm not being heavy. There is potential for any one of us here to have a defiled spirit. Man or woman here. Like I said, you, you spend a, a couple of hours watching pornography. Be honest with yourself, is your spirit defiled? Oh no, my spirit is perfect, I'm fine, it was just my soul, I just thought wrong. I've actually heard people say, and it's still okay, I can still go minister to people. <sighs> See where we're at. If, you, if we're given into bitterness and jealousy and rage and gossip and slander and lust, our spirit's defiled. 
We need repentance and deliverance. It says, cleanse yourself from filthiness of spirit. The spirit. That just kills that whole thing out the water straight away. James says, sin is conceived in the heart. This is written to Christians. It's written to Christians. If any one of us here, myself included, has the capacity to conceive sin in our heart and bring it to birth. Because that's the nature of the heart. You could conceive faith, love, hope in your heart and birth that or conceive sin. We need the baptism of the Spirit. But first of all, we need the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. There is a teaching that we've already got it. We've already got it. That's the Rutherford type teaching. I'm here to tell you there's more of God. There's more of God. There's more of God. When we've been there 10,000 years, by trying to us the sun, there's still more of God. Paul wrote to the, the Ephesians and said, I'm praying for you to get the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your heart be opened, that you be flooded with light, that you may know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, the hope of his calling, and the exceeding greatness of his power in and through you, the same power that he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Amen. I'm praying for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Who's that? Is that the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's a sevenfold spirit. That's two manifestations of the spirit. He's praying for them. Why? Because they didn't have it. Need more. See, I need more. We haven't arrived. I'm complete in Christ, yes. But there's more. I am crucified with Christ, yes. But daily, I crucify the flesh. How? At the altar. The church must have an altar. Guys, it's great. We can go to different events and be blessed. But there's nothing like God's plan for the church is to have proper government. Amen. Proper government. Take this word. Okay. That five old ministry. Elders, deacons. By the way, we believe in women leadership as well. Speak this. Amen. I'm not being misogynistic here. I repeat this. God's plan is church. Fivefold ministry. Elders, deacons. Why? To build a sound, safe house. That you don't just have a frothy, exciting time, but in five years' time, ten years' time, when you're in a crisis and you need people to stand with you, you are part of something solid. Not something that's here today and gone tomorrow. Yeah. And a lot of events do that. Yeah. And there's no government. Yeah. You don't know what the people are carrying. Yeah. Are they in submission? Are they under authority? <laughs> are they in rebellion? You don't know. <laughs> you got to have a church that's solid. And you got to have a church that has an altar. An altar. It's not just, oh, the presence is nice. Hey, I'm asking you humbly. Honor, please. Honor the altar in this church. Do you know, all the glory goes to Jesus. We're all called to sacrifice to a measure. Paul said that I may fill up my flesh, in my flesh, the measure of the sufferings of Christ. To build an altar here, even thus far, has cost us a lot. Please, from the bottom of my heart, honor that. There's, there's, there's great, go and get blessed. Is there an altar? there's more of God we need the deep dealings of God to get the baptism of the spirit in a deeper way listen let's talk about sin people will say here's another one the Holy Spirit doesn't convict of sin they say that John 16 says he convicts the world of sin righteousness and judgment that they don't believe in him. Now, the context of that verse is talking about the world. Granted. But I tell you, we start believe, behaving like the world. The word for convict is the Greek word aleko. Jesus said, those I love, I rebuke. It's the same word. I convict. Aleko. I aleko. Hebrew says, he alekos us. Strengthen your feeble knees when you are rebuked by him, elected by him. Titus 2.11 The grace of God has appeared, sin, say no to unrighteousness. The grace of God is awesome. And the grace of God, you see, we humanize God. There's aspects and attributes of God's character that are so 
to us are contradictory. And to Jesus' character. How can Jesus be this lovely lamb? Lovely lamb. <sighs> Some scriptures talk about not being such a lovely lamb. About the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God. We're going to be with Jesus forever. Jesus appeared to me once in 1999. I couldn't look up. I could just see his feet. He was as real as Richard. Is. And, and I kissed his feet. And I felt his feet. I, I kissed those feet. And we're going to be at his feet forever. And it's going to be beautiful. Tender. There's tender aspects to Jesus. There's tenderness to the Father. You know what? At the same time, Jesus is going to be punishing the sinners and the ungodly in hell forever. And he's not unjust in doing so. The seeker sensitive church, well, that's bad PR. That's bad marketing. I think we need to just gloss that bit out, airbrush that part of him out. No, we have, to, we have to be unashamed. Someone said to me, well, there's a dark side of God, this kind of. No, the dark side is in you. It's in me. It's in us. And so, the Spirit of God is an, he's wonderful, He's amazing. He'll rebuke you. He'll convict you. Do you ever feel that, that discomfort? Maybe you've indulged in a conversation at times and it's truthful. Then the Holy Spirit's convicted you later. You said, but Lord, it was true. It was none of your business. <sighs> you've looked at something. You've said something. The Holy Spirit's convicted you. I know people because they've come under false demonic doctrines have shut out the voice of the Holy Spirit convicting them. We need the blood of Jesus. If we want an outpouring, I want the real Holy Spirit. I don't want a pseudo Holy Spirit. Amen. There's times of joy. Do you know, intimacy with God is like intimacy in marriage, the Bible says. And I'm not going to be disrespectful. There can be intimacy in marriage that full of joy. Full of, what you know, amazing. But you would never be casual about it. You can treat it like a casual thing. That's your wife. That's your husband. It's the same with God. There'll be times of great joy and great laughter. But there's times of reverence and fear. I pray for the spirit of the fear of the Lord to rest upon each of us here. It's a good thing to fear God. The Holy Spirit convicts. It does. It doesn't condemn, but it convicts. John 1, 1 John 1, 1 John, 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. You know the scripture. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. It's the truth. And people will take this and say, this is not for Christians. No way in that passage of scripture is it parentheus, or oh, by the way, this is not for Christians. <sighs> no. The Lord's Prayer. Jesus, teach us how to pray. This is how you pray, Father. No Jew under the old covenant could call him Father. That is a new covenant prayer. Yeah. Father. And it has within it forgive us our sins asking for forgiveness is new covenant anyone who says otherwise is not telling the truth there might be good people nice people but it's not true this is in the new the word confess and I've said this before the word confess is the word homologio and as you probably know the word homo means same homologio means same speech. Logio means speech. In modern terminology, it means this. Call it like it is. I've got issues. No, you don't have issues. You have sin. Call it like it is. I'm speaking to myself. Call it like it is. That means be before God. Get rid of the fig leaf. Stop hiding behind the bush. And come out before him. Feeling ashamed, feeling dirty, feeling lustful, being in your pornography, or whatever, drunkenness, drugs, whatever. That relationship that's wrong, that you know is wrong, and you come out from behind your bush, and you don't call it an issue, and you go, Father, I did it. 
I did that and I call it like it is. And I'm totally honest. I've been rebellious to you, God. I've been disobedient to you, God. I haven't listened to you. I've been, I haven't submitted to authority. This, my life is just a train wreck because I call it like it is. I am responsible. And it's at that point of brutal honesty. That's when the blood cleanses you. Wow. That's when you get free. And when you come before God like that, and you come from behind your fig leaf, from behind your bush, and you feel ashamed, and you're totally honest, and you stop killing yourself and lying to yourself, you can lie to other people. You can't lie to Him. You can't deceive Him. When you stop the game, that's when He just calls you. It's like instant. The blood, you know you're forgiven. And he cleanses you from all that unrighteousness. A lot of people in the church aren't born again. They've never repented. Wow. They've never repented. This is real repentance. Nobody led me to Jesus in 1996. I just got given a Bible in school. I used to read it. And when I just wanted to live for sin, I threw it away. And then I had a crisis in 96. I repented and I got born again. I just said, God, if you're real, if you can help me, have my life. And I prayed, and I was desperate to meet some Christians, desperate for a Bible. And the first Christians I met, I met some real Christians, two guys called Richard and Paul. I didn't know why. I said, guys, can I, I, I need to spend some time with you. I need to confess all my sins to you. And I sat there with them for about an hour and two hours and confessed every sin in my life. And they just sat there and listened and then prayed with me. I don't know what he told me to do that. I told them the good, the bad, it wasn't the good, the bad, and the very ugly. It's, this is radical before God. This will cut out so much people's garbage. Yeah. Real repentance. Yeah. Brings you the spirit. You see, the early Pentecostals were influenced by the Salvation Army, the early Salvation Army. Blood and fire was their slogan. Blood and fire. The blood cleanses you so that the fire comes upon you. Hallelujah. Now listen to this. We're going to have to come close soon. 1 John 3, 7 and 8 says, summarize it. It says, He who practices righteousness is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. We read earlier that all of us sin. But here said, He who practices sins is of the devil. He who does righteousness is of God. So am I, am I of the devil? Am I of God? It means those who practice it as a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Listen, if you've got sin that we don't, the Spirit of God will convict us because He loves you. If we don't confess it and get it dealt with us, it's going to pervert our character. And something of God is going to leave our character. Something of godliness is going to go out of our character. All sin is connected to a deficit of character. A deficit of character. And so unconfessed sin, undealt with sin, brings a bent and a perversion into the character. And it becomes an iniquity. And that calls forth curse. And withholds blessings. God wants a pure church. God doesn't want a church where people prophesy. And it's 60% God, 20% flesh, and 20% the spirit of witchcraft. Wow. Ooh. That, do you know what the word iniquity means? It means mixture. 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 God wants to bring an outpouring of the spirit. I've been in Africa 10 times. God told me to stop going in 2014 was my last trip to Uganda. And I've seen hunger like you can never believe. Hunger for God. Desperation for God. And when we first went to King Jesus in Miami, I saw the desperation and the hunger for God. Our apostle drives people into the presence of God. You grab you by the scruff of the neck and throw you into the presence of God. Praise God. It's all about the presence. I saw hunger there that I've never seen. Tangible presence. You can physically 
feel the presence of God in that place. And when I've been to Africa, I've seen a hunger that you can never believe. You've got to have a heart encounter. We can't just be touched and not changed. I, I don't know. I just need to be in the presence of God. This this thing. I, I, a few years ago, I got asked to speak at some theological school in Leeds. Come and speak to the students about the power of God. And they were from different countries. And the level of hunger must have been a, it was like the Ice Age. It was a funeral parlor. They were so learned. So learned. Clouds without water, without the Spirit. I don't want to be a cloud without water. I'm hungry for God. God's been preparing my heart. I'm hungry for God. Are you hungry for God? Please, I'm, I'm calling out you. Be hungry for God. The blood of Jesus has got to get deep in on the inside of you. The blood of Jesus has got to get deep in on the inside of you. And this is what will bring the outpouring of the Spirit. Father God, I'm praying right now for these people here. I'm crying out, Father, for us all, Father, that you turn our lives upside down, Father, that you deal with us, that we come, that we receive the power of the blood where we've never received it before, that we won't harden our hearts against you, Lord. God, I pray that we won't harden our hearts. Guys, you want to be hungry for God. Do you want to be really hungry for God? You might have five years left on this planet. You might have ten years. That's it. You might only have ten years left. That's it. And Jesus is coming. I don't want that chip in the head of the, of the, of the you know. I want to be taken. I don't want to reason this out. I want my heart to be changed. If I'm not feeling the presence, it's because I've got a problem in my heart. Let's just pray right now.